Chapter 3 Painting in Italy from the Beginning of the Renaissance to the Present Century Part 3 When Francis returned to France, he desired to cut out the wall on which the Last Supper was painted and carry it to his own country. This proved to be impossible and it is much to be regretted as it is probable that it could have been thus removed it would have been better preserved. However, not being able to take the artist's great work, the king took Leonardo himself together with his favorite pupils and friends and his devoted servant. In France, Leonardo was treated with consideration. He resided near Amboise, where he could mingle with the court. It is said that although he was, he was so much admired that the courtiers imitated his dress and the cut of his beard and hair. He was given the charge of all artistic matters in France, and doubtless Francis hoped that he would found an academy as he had done at Milan. But he seems to have left all his energy, all desire for work on the Italian side of the Alps. He made few plans, but he brought no great thing to pass and soon his health failed and he fell into a decline. He gave a great attention to religious matters, received the sacrament, and made his will, and put his worldly affairs in order. The king was accustomed to visit him frequently, and on the last day of his life, when the sovereign entered the room, Leonardo desired to be raised up as a matter of respect to the king. Sitting, he conversed of his sufferings and lamented that he had done so little for God and man. Just then, he was seized with an attack of pain. The king rose to support him, and thus, in the arms of Francis, the great master breathed his last. This has sometimes been doubted, but the modern French critics agree with the ancient writers who give this account of his end. He was buried in the church of St. Florentine at Amboise, and it is not known that any monument was erected over him. In 1808, the church was destroyed. In 1863, Arsene Jose with others made search for the grave of Leonardo, and it is believed that his remains were found. In 1873, a noble monument was erected in Milan to the memory of the Vinci. It is near in the entrance to the arcade of Victor Emmanuel. The statue of the master stands on a high pedestal in a thoughtful altitude. The head bowed down and the arms crossed on the breast. Below are other statues and rich bas reliefs, and one inscription speaks of him as the renewer of the arts and sciences. Many of his writings are in the libraries of Europe in manuscript form. His best known work is the Trattato della Pittura and has been translated into English. As an engineer, his canal of Mortesana was enough to give him fame. As an artist, he may be called the poet of painters. And if those who followed him surpassed him, it should be remembered that it is easier to advance in a path once opened than to discover a new path. Personally, he was much beloved, and though he lived when morals were at a low estimate. He led a proper and reputable life. His pictures had done so little for God and man. Just then he was seized with an attack of pain. The king rose to support him, 
and thus in the arms of Francis the great master breathed his last. This has sometimes been doubted, but the modern French critics agree with the ancient writers who give this account of his end. He was buried in the church of St. Florentine at Amboise and it is not known that any monument was erected over him. In 1808, the church was destroyed. In 1863, Arsene Jose with others made a search for the grave of Leonardo, and it is believed that his remains were found. In 1873, a noble monument was erected in Milan to the memory of Da Vinci. It is near the entrance to the arcade of Victor Emmanuel. The statue of the master stands on a high pedestal in a thoughtful attitude, the head bowed down and the arms crossed on the breast. Below are other statues and rich bas reliefs and one inscription speaks of him as the renewer of the arts and sciences. Many of his writings are in the libraries of Europe in manuscript form. His best known work is the Tratato de la Pittura and has been translated into English. As an engineer, his canal of Marzana was enough to give him fame. As an artist, he may be called the poet of painters. And if those who followed him surpassed him, it should be remembered that it is easier to advance in a path once opened than to discover a new path. Personally, he was much beloved, and though he lived with morals were at low estimate, he led a proper and reputable life. His pictures were pure in their spirit, and he seemed only to desire the progress of art and science. And it is a pleasure to read and learn of him, as it is to see his works. Other good artists of the Lombard school in the 15th century were Bernardino Luini, about 1460 to 1530, who was the best pupil of Leonardo, Giovanni Antonio Beltraffio, Gaudenzio Ferrari, Ambrogio Borgognon, and Andrea Solario, whose age is not known. We return now to the Florentine school at a time when the most remarkable period of its existence was about to begin. We shall speak first of Fra Bartolomeo or Baccio de la Porta, also called Frate II. He was born at Savignano and studied at Florence under Cosimo Rosselli. But was much influenced by the works of Leonardo da Vinci. This painter became famous for the beauty of his pictures of the Madonna and at the time when the great Savonarola went to Florence Bartolomeo, was employed in the convent of San Marco, where the preacher lived. The artist became the devoted friend of the preacher, and when the latter was seized, tortured and burned, Bartolomeo became a friar and left his pictures to be finished by his pupil Albert Tinelli. For four years, he lived the most austere life and did not touch his brush. Then, his superior commanded him to resume his art, but the painter had no interest in it. About this time, Raphael sought him out and became his friend. He also instructed the monk in perspective and in turn Raphael learned from him. For Fra Bartolomeo was the first artist who used lay figures in arranging his draperies. He also told Raphael some secrets of colors. About 1513, Bartolomeo went to Rome, and after his return to his convent, he began what promised 
to be a wonderful artistic career. But he only lived four years more, and the amount of his work was so small that his pictures are now rare. His Madonnas, saints, and angels are holy in their effect. His representations of architecture are grand, and while his works are not strong or powerful, they give much pleasure to those who see them. At a proper age, Angelo was taken to Florence and placed in school. But he spent his time mostly in drawing. And having made the acquaintance of Francesco Granacci at the time a pupil with Gerlandajo, he borrowed from his designs and materials by which to carry on his beloved pursuits. Michelangelo's desire to become an artist was violently opposed by his father and his uncles, for they desired him to be a silk and woolen merchant and sustain the commercial reputation of the family. But so determined was he that finally his father yielded, and in 1488 placed him in the studio of Gerlandajo. Here, the boy of 13 worked with great diligence. He learned how to prepare colors and to lay the groundwork of frescoes, and he was set to copy drawings. Very soon, he wearied of this and began to make original designs after his own ideas. At one time, he corrected a drawing of his masters. When he saw this, 60 years later, he said, I almost think that I knew more of art in my youth than I do in my old age. When Michelangelo went to Gerlandajo, that master was employed on the restoration of the choir of Santa Maria Novella so that the boy came at once into the midst of important work. One day, he drew a picture of the scaffolding and all that belonged to it, with the painters at work. Thereon, when his master saw it, he exclaimed, he already understands more than I do myself. This excellence in the scholar roused the jealousy of the master, as well as of his other pupils. And it was a relief to Michelangelo when, in answer to a request from Lorenzo de' Medici, he and Francesco Granacci were named by Gerlandajo as his two most promising scholars. And were then sent to the academy which the duke had established. The art treasures which Lorenzo gave for the use of the students were arranged in the gardens of San Marco and here, under the instruction of the old Bertoldo, Angelo forgot painting in his enthusiasm for sculpture. He first copied the face of a faun but he changed it somewhat and opened the mouth so that the teeth could be seen. When Lorenzo visited the garden, he praised the work, but said, You have made your phone so old, and yet you have left him all his teeth. You should have known that at such an advanced age, there are generally some wanting. The next time he came there was a gap in the teeth and so well done that he was delighted. This work is now in the Uffizi Gallery. Lorenzo now sent for the father of Angelo and asked that the son might live in the Medici Palace under his own care. Somewhat reluctantly, the father consented and the duke gave him an office in the custom house. From this time for three years, Angelo sat daily at the duke's table and was treated as one of his own family. He was properly clothed and had allowance of five ducats a month for pocket money. It was the custom with Lorenzo to give an entertainment every day. 
he took the head of the table and whoever came first had a seat next him. It often happened that Michelangelo had this place. Lorenzo was the head of Florence and Florence was the head of art, poetry, and all scholarly thought. Thus, in the home of, of the Medici, the young artist heard, learned, talk upon all subjects of interest. He saw there all the celebrated men who lived in the city or visited it, and his life so near Lorenzo for a thoughtful youth as he was amounted to an education. Granacci, at the time a pupil with Gerlandajo, he borrowed from his designs and materials by which to carry on his beloved pursuits. Michelangelo's desire to become an artist was violently opposed by his father and his uncles, for they desired him to be a silk and woodland merchant and sustain the commercial reputation of the family. But so determined was he that finally his father yielded and in 1488 placed him in the studio of Gorlandajo. Here the boy of 13 worked with great diligence. He learned how to prepare colors and to lay the groundwork of frescoes and he was set to copy drawings. Very soon, he wearied of this and began to make original designs after his own ideas. At one time, he corrected a drawing of his masters when he saw this 60 years later, he said, I almost think that I knew more of art in my youth than I do in my old age. When Michelangelo went to Gerlandajo, that master was employed on the restoration of the choir of Santa Maria Novella, so that the boy came at once into the midst of important work. One day, he drew a picture of the scaffolding and all that belonged to it. With the painters at work thereon, when his master saw it, he exclaimed, He already understands more than I do myself. This excellence in the scholar roused with the jealousy of the master as well as of his other pupils. And it was a relief to Michelangelo when, in answer to a request from Lorenzo de' Medici, he and Francesco Granacci were named by Gerlandajo as his two most promising scholars, and were then sent to the academy which the Duke had established. The art treasures which Lorenzo gave for the use of the students were arranged in the gardens of San Marco, and here, under the instruction of old Bertoldio, Angelo forgot painting in his enthusiasm for sculpture. He first copied the face of a faun, but he changed it somewhat, and opened the mouth so that the teeth could be seen. When Lorenzo visited the garden, he praised the work, but said, You have made your phone so old, and yet you have left him all his teeth. You should have known that at such an advanced age, there are generally some wanting. The next time he came there was a gap in the teeth, and so well done that he was delighted. This work is now in the Uffizi Gallery. Lorenzo now sent for the father of Angelo and asked that the son might live in the Medici palace under his own care. Somewhat reluctantly, the father consented and the duke gave him an office in the custom house. From this time for three years, Angelo sat daily at the duke's table and was treated as one of his own family. He was properly clothed and had an allowance of five ducats a month for pocket money. It was a custom with Lorenzo to give an entertainment every day. He took the head of the table and whoever came first had a seat next him. It often happened 
that Michael Angelo had this place. Lorenzo was the head of Florence and Florence was the head of art, poetry, and all scholarly thought. Thus, in the home of the Medici, the young artist heard learned talk about all subjects of interest. He saw there all the celebrated men who live in the city, or visited, and his life so near Lorenzo for a thoughtful youth, as he was amounted to an education. Michelangelo was much affected by this, and throughout his long life remembered Savonarola with true respect and affection, and his brother Leonardo Bonarotti was so far influenced that he withdrew from the world and became a Dominican monk. Michelangelo's diligence was great. He not only studied sculpture, but he found time to copy some of the fine old frescoes in the Church of the Carmen. He gave great attention to the study of anatomy, and he was known throughout the city for his talents, and for his pride and bad temper, he held himself aloof from his fellow pupils, and one day, in a quarrel with Pietro Torrigiano, the latter gave Angelo a blow and crushed his nose so badly that he was disfigured for life. Torrigiano was banished for, he, for this offense and went to England. He ended his life in a Spanish prison. In the spring of 1492, Lorenzo de' Medici died. Michelangelo was deeply grieved at the loss of his best friend. He left the Medici palace and opened a studio in his father's house, where he worked diligently for two years, making a statue of Hercules and two Madonnas. After two years there, he came a great snowstorm, and Piero de' Medici sent for the artist to make a snow statue in his courtyard. He also invited Michelangelo to live again in the palace, and the invitation was accepted. The society of Florence at this time was not a high moral tone, and in the year in which Michelangelo entered the palace, a monk called Savonarola came to Florence to preach against the customs and the crimes of the city. Michelangelo was much affected by this, and throughout his long life, remembered Savonarola with true respect and affection. And his brother, Leonardo Bonarotti, was so far influenced that he withdrew from the world and became a Dominican monk. Michelangelo's diligence was great. He not only studied sculpture, but he found time to copy some of the fine old frescoes in the Church of the Carmine. He gave great attention to the study of anatomy, and he was known throughout the city for his talents, and for his pride and bad temper. He held himself aloof from his fellow pupils, and one day, in a quarrel with Pietro Torrigiano, the latter gave Angelo a blow and crushed in his nose so badly that he was disfigured for life. Torrigiano was banished for his offense and went to England. He ended his life in a Spanish prison. In the spring of 1492, Lorenzo de' Medici died. Michelangelo was deeply grieved at the loss of his best friend. He left the Medici Palace and opened a studio in his father's house, where he worked diligently for two years, making a statue of Hercules and two Madonnas. After two years, there came a great snowstorm, and Pietro de' Medici sent for the artist to make a snow statue in his courtyard. He also invited Michelangelo to live again in the palace, and the invitation was accepted. But all was so changed there that he embraced the first opportunity to live, and during a political disturbance fled from the city with two friends and made his way to Venice. There 
he met the noble Aldo Brandi of Bologna who invited the sculptor to his home where he remained about a year and then returned to his studio in Florence. Soon after this, he made a beautiful sleeping cupid and when the young Lorenzo de' Medici saw it, he advised Michelangelo to bury it in the ground for a season and thus make it look like an antique marble. After this was done, Lorenzo sent it to Rome and sold it to the Cardinal Riario and gave the sculptor 30 ducats. In some way, the truth of the matter reached the ears of the Cardinal who sent his agent to Florence to find the artist. When Michelangelo heard that 200 ducats had been paid for his cupid, he knew that he had been deceived. The Cardinal's agent invited him to go to Rome and he gladly went. The oldest existing writing from the hand of Michelangelo is the letter which he wrote to Lorenzo to inform him of his arrival in Rome. He was then 20 year, 1 years old and spoke with joy of all the beautiful things he had seen. Not long after he reached Rome, he made the statue of the drunken Bacchus, now in the Uffizi Gallery and then the Virgin Mary sitting near the place of the cross and holding the body of the dead Christ. The art term for the subject is La Pieta. From the time that Michelangelo made this beautiful work, he was the first sculptor of the world, though he was but 24 years old. The Pieta was placed in St. Peter's Church where it still remains. The next year, he returned to Florence. He was occupied with both painting and sculpture and was soon employed on Miss David, one of his greatest works. This statue weighed 18,000 pounds and its removal from the studio in which it was made to the palace where it was to stand. Next, the gate of the Palazzo Vecchio was a difficult undertaking. It was last put in place on May 18, 1504. There, it remained until a few years ago. When, on account of its crumbling from the effect of the weather, it was removed to the Academy of Fine Arts by means of a railroad built for the purpose. About this time, a rivalry sprang up between Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. They were very unlike in their characters and mode of life. Michelangelo was bitter, ironical, and liked to be alone. Leonardo loved to be gay and to see the world. Michelangelo lived so that when he was old, he said, Rich as I am, I have always lived like a poor man. Leonardo enjoyed luxury and kept a fine house with horses and servants. They had entered into a competition which was likely to result in serious trouble. When Pope Julius II summoned Michelangelo to Rome, the Pope gave him an order to build him a splendid tomb. But the enemies of the sculptor made trouble for him, and one morning, he was refused admission to the Pope's palace. He then left Rome, sending this letter to the Pope. Most Holy Father, I was this morning driven from the palace by the order of Your Holiness. If you require me in the future, you can seek me elsewhere than at Rome. Then he went to Florence and the Pope sent him for him again and again. But he did not go. Meantime, he finished his design and received the commission that he and Leonardo had striven for, which was to decorate the hall of the Grand Council with pictures. At last, in 1506, the Pope was in Bologna and again sent for Michael Angelo. 
he went and was forgiven for his offense and received an order for a colossal statue of the Pope in bronze. When this was finished in 1508 and put before the Church of St. Petronio, Michelangelo returned to Florence. He had not made friends in Bologna. His forbidding manner did not encourage others to associate with him. But we now know from his letters that he had great trials. His family was poor and all relied on him. Indeed, his life was full of care and sadness. In 1508, he was again summoned to Rome with the Pope, who insisted that he should paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. Michelangelo did not wish to do this, as he had done not great painting. It proved to be one of his most famous works, but he had a great deal of trouble in it. On one occasion, the Pope threatened to throw the artist from the scaffolding. The Pope complained also that the pictures look poor, to this the artist replied, They are only poor people whom I have painted there, and did not wear gold on their garments. The subjects were from the Bible, when the artist would have a leave of absence to go to Florence. The Pope got so angry that he struck him, but in spite of all, this great painting was finished in 1512. Grimm in his Life of Michelangelo says, It indeed, the meeting of these two men, in the one such perseverance in requiring and in the other such power of fulfilling to produce this monument of human art.